Hello and welcome to the Plan Communities Podcast. I'm your host, Preston Martin. This is episode two of an Adrian Opal Group podcast series in which we will begin to explore the industry of plan communities around the world. Today we are speaking with Nicole Lopez, a community manager with Goodwin Management. Goodwin is a homeowners association management company based in Austin, Texas. And we're happy to meet with Nicole to discuss her experience leading a team that serves hundreds of plan communities in the greater Austin area. All right. So, Nicole, thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. Glad to hear it. So, let's let's go ahead and jump right in to the rundown of how you got involved in the space of, of planned communities. What what kind of brought you into this industry? And we could talk a little bit about the company you work with, uh, good okay. um, with Good One and everything, and, and kind of dig into the details. Okay. Perfect. Um, you know, I kind of landed in. HOA management by mistake. I was 22 years old and I wanted to do what everybody in California was doing at the time. And that was become a real estate agent. You know, I just, that was where my heart was at. And so I was um, working for a company and they just were doing uh, leasing and I loved it. And I I got to learn so much about real estate um, through working through that company. And then my location was changing. And so I was looking for something different. Um, still in the real estate industry. And a lady approached me and said, you know what? I think you'd be really great at HOA management. And I was so clueless about that. And I said, what is HOA management? What's a board of directors? You know, I didn't know anything. And she kind of took me under her wing and uh, got me involved with all of the um, organizations in my area and uh, just really kind of guided me. And I've been doing it ever since. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's been one of those things that I just, I enjoy so much because of my interaction with people and problem solving and just really giving people that understanding of where they live doesn't have to be miserable, which some of the, you know, some of the judgments of HOA consist of, oh my gosh, living in an HOA would be awful. I would never want somebody telling me what to do. But, you know, in the long run, people actually who live in an HOA, are really grateful that they do. If they have a manager that's able to guide them and give them the pros and cons of HOA living. Yeah, definitely. No, I I, I think we all are familiar with uh, the kind of stereotype of a, a draconian HOA, you know, that has these, um, you know, crazy requirements for uh, how, you know, how your grass is cut and, and, you know, what color your house can be and so on. Um, so a lot of people, I think, have that impression, but um, definitely there is a, a, a huge positive side to to HOA and how how it can support and provide uh, services to people living in a community uh, such exactly. as those that, that you and your company manage. Um, and and I'll say yeah. as a side note, also it's pretty funny. A couple of days ago, I spoke with another uh, master plan community management company a representative from um, from who also California to Austin and went through very much a similar process. So it's it's interesting to see the parallel there. Uh, it yeah. seems like a more common story than you might think. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And so long story short, I just started developing relationships and, and getting to know board of directors and how all the ins and outs work. And yeah, and providing that support has been such a great reward at the end of the day when people actually start to enjoy where they live. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a nice industry to work in. And, um, you know, it, it's all very, and it, it's an awesome industry if you allow it to be you know, and you enjoy what you do. And I think that's the difference. Absolutely. So walk us through what the services look like from an HOA to the, the home of people living in these communities. Give us a sense of, of how that interaction takes place and, and the different layers of support that you guys. So somebody living in an HOA community would reach out to a management company or their manager if they needed assistance with paying their bill. You know, everybody has their monthly, quarterly, annually assessments, and they would reach out to us in assistance for that. They would reach out to us if they needed assistance with their amenities, how to gain access. Um, They inform us when things in the community are not right, whether it's a landscaping issue, an amenity access issue, um, an accounting issue. We are the go-to for everything pertaining to the community in which they live. And so anything regarding maintenance issues, financial issues, and so forth, we are, we are the main contact. Um, we are the middleman between the resident and the vendors. 
And so we are multitasking 24 <laughs> seven. And many managers don't just have one community, they have multiple. And so the day in the life of a manager is very much, you know, it could easily be a eight to 15 hour day, depending on what's going on. And so in regards to residents, yeah, they, we are, we are the go-to for everything for the community and where they live. And that includes things like um, working with uh, utility companies like power, um, infrastructure, repair and support, uh, water. You know, is that, is that all that stuff handled via the HOA in your communities? Sometimes it depends. If it's a planned unit development, I'm referring to single family homes. No, typically the owner is responsible for setting up their own utilities. In some cases, like condominiums, the HOA will oversee that task, but it's not common. A lot of times, um, owners, condominium owners, and single family homes, they kind of handle that their own utilities. We handle anything pertaining to common area. Mm -hmm. um, so the community common area, amenities, landscaping, anything that those that their HOA dues pay for, that is the management's responsibility to handle and to oversee and to ensure that it's maintained and repaired properly. Gotcha. Yeah, that's an important distinction. So yeah. um, give us a sense of the the variation in, in different types of communities that uh, you guys oversee or are involved in. Um, you mentioned Condominiums, apartment buildings, um, single family, kind of uh, probably suburban communities. So if you could give us basically a, a breakdown of the different classifications and then also how many communities your company is involved with overall. Well, Goodwin Management specifically, we have different locations. Uh, we have an office in Dallas, Austin, and San Antonio. And I believe we have a few satellite offices that are a little bit smaller, um, but still do the same task. I believe we are roughly at 900 communities. And these are communities that are homeowners associations. We only manage homeowners associations. We do not do apartment living, which is different from HOA. And I believe we have some commercial properties as well that we oversee. Um, I'm removed from that department. I don't, I don't know much about our commercial department, but I know that it is something that we do also. Um, the difference between apartment living, let's say in condo, is typically with apartments, managers are on site. There's an issue, you can call the manager, you have a maintenance team, um, everything's pretty regulated. With condominiums, it's typically owner, you know, the, the homes are owner occupied. Very rarely do I have condominiums that are um, tenants. And the residents that live there, the owners that own that, that townhome or condo rather, they pay monthly dues. And those dues go towards those common area things like landscaping, front entry, um, enhancements, you know, pool maintenance, any type of janitorial, something like that. Uh, whereas apartments, you don't pay your dues. Your rent goes towards, you know, whatever it is, and you call it a day. So condo owners pay their mortgage. And in addition to that, they also pay their monthly dues. So there is that distinct, uh, distinction. And they have a manager that they can call at any time, a community manager, but not a manager that's typically on site. Now, single family homes, depending on size and what is required, there are single family home developments that require an on-site manager because of the extensiveness of what is required. Large amenities, um, you know, over a thousand residents, and it's just needed. You know, it's a community that may be, that may be a little high maintenance. Uh, they require a lot of attention. They require a lot of, you know, interaction with vendors daily, whereas uh, some communities you can kind of just they're very self-sufficient. They don't require too much. And, you know, so that's always the judgment call of upper management, whether or not this community or that community would benefit from having an on-site manager. Gotcha. And I'm sure that has to do not only with size, but also with the like demographics or the, the basic kind of underlying purpose of that community, say a retirement community versus one that's more modeled towards families, like in their Exactly. Um, you know, the middle portion of their life. So. Exactly. Yes, most definitely. Well, oh, great. So just to understand the, the stage at which your business is involved, you guys are purely on the management side. You're not 
you're not involved in the development um, or construction of these these communities, but rather they're built out and people are moving in or people are living there. Well, the exciting thing is, is even though we are not involved in, let's say, construction of development, we work with tons of developers. So let's say a developer has land and they are developing and, and there's builders that have purchased the lots and now we're going to have homes and it, it, it has been designated in, in a homeowners association and they need management from square one. So even though we are not involved in the construction, we are still managing these developments from square one. And we are involved with working with project managers to ensure that, you know, from from the day the first resident moves in, the community is up to par. And, you know, some of the struggle with new developments and new construction is you're dealing with construction matters, you know, broken lines. You know, my biggest complaint with new developments is construction noise or trash from, from material that's been delivered. Um, and that's where the manager would step in. We remind the project manager on site, hey, the common areas need to be kept clean. Or, hey, the start time for construction is 7 a.m., not 5.30 in the morning. Things like that. So uh, we are not involved in the plans so much, but we are involved in assisting the very first homeowner that purchases within that new development. And if you're fortunate enough, like myself, I have multiple developments that I have overseen from the beginning. And the end result is absolutely amazing. And the positive and the number one thing that I've benefited from is when you've been there from the beginning, not only have you built relationship with the actual developer, but from the residents who may or may not have had experience with living in a new development, having HOA rules, um, or, even, or even understanding what a manager's role and responsibilities are. So yes, we do have new developments. We do take over developments in addition to homes that are already established and have been established for 20 plus years. There is such a, there is such a, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it can go from one in, one end of the spectrum to another. And HOA management is so vast that you never know what you're getting when, <laughs> when a new community comes your way, whether it's already established or a completely new development. That makes a lot of sense. Now, um, you're based in, in Austin, right? That, uh, yes. Currently, you're in, the, you're in the Austin office. We're talking to some representatives from another developer manager of uh, planned communities in the Austin area. We've been learning a lot about the growth that that city has experienced over the past 10 years. I personally have some friends who live uh, out there as well. Um, so I've, I've learned a lot from them about how things are going from a, from a homeowner's perspective. I was wondering if you could comment on your experience with that, that growth and population and all the infrastructure and everything. I'm sure traffic's pretty bad <laughs> as well. Yes, um, yes. So how I'm is that going from the perspective of, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah go ahead. No, and I was going to say, I moved to Texas seven years ago, and the growth that has occurred from 2015 to 2022 has been incredible. And I can pretty much say that the growth has also been an opportunity for HOA management companies to gain. You know, there isn't one piece of land that I have seen that hasn't been built upon. And I don't necessarily think that Austin was ready, you know, had the infrastructure to prepare, but they're getting there and they're trying. But with that, there is a lot of construction. There is a lot of, um, there's a lot more traffic. You know, I thought I would be getting away from traffic like the 101 or the 10 freeway, but nope, it followed me here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's been interesting to see the growth. And it's very exciting to see people who have moved here who are excited to be here. And I know that feeling because I was the exact same way when I came here from California. Um, but yes, it is frustrating at times. But, you know, in the long run, I know it's going to be a huge benefit to our state of Texas and uh, for the families that live here looking for something different, whether they're moving out of California or New York or Florida or, or wherever. You know, at the end of the day, everybody's just looking for something better, whether it's for them individually or for their family. So it's always exciting to watch to see where you're, you know, little, what started out as a small town has now grown. And, you know, the benefit is more shopping. <laughs> 
a lot more cooler places to visit. And, um, you know, so that's always fun. But I do miss the small town that it was seven years ago. And I'm sure people can say that they've lived here their whole life and they miss how it was 20 years ago. But yeah, it's been exciting. And I'm excited for our town to see uh, what comes about as far as uh, new developments or, like I said, new areas to shop or take your children, um, things along, things such as that. So we're excited. Absolutely. And you have seen it grow over the last seven years. And, and certainly um, Austin, as just one example, has been has been growing all throughout that period of time. But I'm curious to hear your perspective on both uh, or the changes that have taken place during this era of COVID and um, what now I, I suppose we could call the, the post-COVID era. Um, if you look at um, or, or, or polls that have been done, um, census data that has been gathered in the past couple of years, uh, certainly California has uh, is experiencing an exodus. You know, a lot of people moving out to, pl- to uh, places in Texas, places in Idaho, Montana, uh, people moving out of cities in the East Coast. Oh, and um, I believe Texas has received the biggest population um, increases as a result of that. So I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective and um, as, a, as a manager of planned communities, if you have seen um, an increase in developments along those lines, or have you seen a lot of people coming in uh, to these communities from updates looking to kind of get grounded um, in Austin? How, how, have, uh, how have you experienced that change, if at all? Yeah, so it's been interesting. You know, it's it's 50-50, lots of new families, but also I feel lots of investors taking advantage of the um, cost of living in Texas. You know, yes, the market has increased exponentially, but it's 50-50. I work with a lot of investors who purchase multiple homes in different, you know, communities throughout Austin. And then I work with families who have left their state that they've lived in their whole life to come to Texas and start new. So, yeah. It's, you know, from a financial um, aspect, it's been a huge, uh, the influx of uh, people moving here has been astronomical and developers are just building away and, you know, homes don't stay on the market for very long. So pros and cons, you know, with the influx of everyone moving here, homes have increased, making it difficult to buy for those who might not qualify for a $500,000 loan. And also shocking to those that lived here 20 years thinking, wow, I purchased my home for 105000 and now it's worth half a million. So yeah, you know, I have seen the, the influx of developments just in my area and, you know, pros and cons to both. Investors really taking advantage while families are, are moving here to try to start something new and, and go forward. But yeah, it, I know Texas specifically has been hit with the influx of housing. And the, in addition to all the construction. Yeah, absolutely. And how do you see it playing out since you've been there and, and you've been working in this industry during your, your stay? Uh, do you have any, any thoughts or any, any like uh, prognoses for, for how these trends are, are playing out? Well, I think like anything, as long as people are willing, there's always going to be something. You know, if people are wanting to move here and live in homes and willing to pay the price, there's always going to be that developer or developers who are going to take advantage of that and build. And, you know, it can go either way. You know how the market is so finicky at times when the second the market crashes, another opportunity for investors. And, you know, people like myself who've never owned a home to take advantage of that that lower market. But um, currently, you know, as long as there's an influx of people moving here and willing to buy and need a place, there's always going to be that opportunity for developers to start building and create new developments. So, yeah. No, definitely. And one of the trends that we're interested in following um, as we talk to people in this field and different uh, kinds of stakeholders and developing communities uh, around the world is the phenomenon of this post-COVID shift to remote or, or home work. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of companies have shifted over uh, just out of necessity w- with COVID and for, you know, for various reasons, um, sometimes just simply based productivity, but in other cases, it's quality of life, you know, so on and so forth. Um, many, many companies are now giving their, their employees more freedom to work from home um, or to work uh, outside of their like typical headquarters um, towns or cities. And so I, I think, and, and what we have seen 
uh, is that a lot of these people who are moving, you know, they four or five years ago would not have been able to make a shift and, and move to a new state or move to somewhere that they, was more suitable for their purposes because of work, you know, because they were tied to a location. But now uh, that barrier has, is being removed or, or is largely gone for a lot of people in the United States. And so I'm curious to hear if, if you have heard from your uh, homeowners and people in, in your orbit about this factor and sort of them moving to Austin or, or um, moving to one of your communities or hearing that, yeah. I think, is, uh, is is something that we're we're taking a close look at. And so I'm curious to hear your experience with that as well. Absolutely. I think we are, you know, two years later, I think we're at, we're at a position now where employers recognize uh, they don't have to have their employees at a brick and mortar building in order to be successful as a company. Um, you know, your employees have worked for you for X amount of months or even years. And, you know, with technology and its advancements, we're at a place now where employers don't, you know, you can be successful with your employees working from home. And honestly, I feel like employees are more, um, you know, get more done while at home. There's so many distractions at work. And I know that I'm guilty of going to work and wanting to talk and chat with everybody about their weekend. And um, the con is you don't see your your colleagues as much and you miss out on that, you know, camaraderie with the people you work with. But as far as working from home, yes, uh, you can be a successful business and having employees you trust know get the job done while working at home. And like I said, with the advancement of technology, meetings can still happen. Communication with upper management, whoever it may be, there's so many portals communicate that, you know, you don't have to walk to your boss's office anymore. You can send them a meeting through Teams or, you know, a quick email through Outlook and still achieve the same, you know, the same goals in uh, getting the task done. A lot of the residents where, you know, in the communities that I manage, they do work from home. And depending on what it is, you know, a lot of them, if they own or operate a daycare center, of course, they have to be on site, but, um, or something like that. But most of the residents that I speak with work from home. and. I, I just think it's been, a, I personally enjoy it. I'm a single mom of two boys and I have made the decision to homeschool and uh, it has allowed me to do both to, I, I, in this industry, there's already a lot of flexibility just because you have to be out and about at times looking at your properties and meeting vendors on site. And there's just so many opportunities to take my kids with me, you know, and for those who might not be in property management and working in a different industry, it's just nice to have that flexibility. That uh, you don't have to clock in and out if you just want to go to Starbucks real quick, <laughs> you know. And and it's just it's just nice to be able to have employers who trust that you're doing a good job, and they don't have to have their eyeballs on you 24/7 while you're sitting in a cubicle. I feel that even though with the stress of COVID, it has also brought a little bit of peace with allowing mothers and fathers and and um, you know families to be together. And uh, it's, it's just been nice from my perspective, working for an employer that trusts me so much and knows that I'm doing a really great job for them. And then at the end of the day, when I work 12 hours from home, um, I'm still with my children. And I feel that, like, like I said, even with the stress of COVID, that people have had a little bit of peace being able to be with their family while still owning their income. And to answer your other question, lots of people are in the same position as myself. And like I said, depending what industry they're in, the majority of them are operating from their homes. Well, that's very interesting to hear that um, the majority of the, the homeowners you're you're working with are in some capacity working from home. So it's, yes, I, I, I think I, it's definitely a growing trend. Mine. Yeah, a great friend of mine actually, you know, California raised and now lives in Montana and you know, followed her family to Montana and still operates on California time and keep, you know, has kept her job while enjoying her life in Montana. And, you know, I, I feel a lot of people have, you know, they're just able to coordinate their schedules now and work for employers that are, I don't want to say lightening up, but just becoming, we've, I, you know, back in the day, we were so accustomed to clocking in and out and our boss is always watching us, you know, and right, that's how, right. you know, that's the majority of what my jobs have always been. Mm -hmm. And so it's like I said, the flexibility and working for such an amazing company like Goodwin that trusts their employees. And whether you're working remote or you're in the office, the level of support 
that they provide is, you know, it allows you to have that freedom and that peace, you know, whether you're an employee or employer, you have that peace knowing that your, your company that you work for is providing such support. So either way, you can't fail. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a win-win. Of course, it will depend on the industry, but um, as long as productivity remains strong, you know, employers maybe can, um, can cut down on other expenses like office space may be less necessary, or you can cut down on the overall amount yeah. of office space, you know, transportation costs, um, a lot of, a lot of stuff that people have to deal with, you know, you're losing exactly. two hours a day in traffic, no, that's no oh, longer, yes. you know, all that stuff adds up and yes, it doesn't, um, it doesn't strike me or my colleagues as, as to too much of a leap to say that, you know, a good portion of, uh, service jobs over the course of the next 10 years or so will be more or less uh, work from home compatible, um, if not totally shifted in that in that direction. Um, there are a lot of a lot of ways that 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 can be suitable and, and work. And I think a lot of people <laughs> who've uh, experienced it, as you've said, over the last couple of years, you know, they've really taken to it as a as like a part of their life now. Absolutely. Yes, most definitely. Well, great. So I, I yeah, thanks for unpacking that for us. Before we close, I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of the types of stuff that um, you guys are, the projects that you're working on now, maybe tell us a little bit about some of the common challenges that like an HOA will face, you know, different things that you guys have to, to overcome and, and, and how you deal with those, um, those like issues with, uh, you know, maintaining the, the, the right type of community atmosphere for all of uh, the homeowners and everything like that. Um, walk us through some of those challenges. Well, you know, one of the things that Goodwin really pushes is people matter. And people matter so much. And even during this COVID, you know, the last two years of COVID, you know, we've had to really, as a, you know, individuals come to terms with, you know, those that have lost their lives and those that are struggling or lost their jobs and, and all of that. And, you know, we've, we deal with so many types of individuals and we never know what they're going through or what they've been through. And yes, people matter. And I love that I work for Goodwin that has a motto, uh, a motto like that. Um, people matter. We love one another. And it not, not only does it transfer to our residents and we do what we can for them, but it's also the same thing within the company, that family vibe. And I think one of the things that we struggle with the most, whether it's the management company as a, as a whole or uh, managers individually is, you know, at the end of the day, if we feel that we've let someone down or we haven't been able to assist them properly, um, I think we struggle with that. You know, those are the things that keep us up at night. And, you know, we want to always make sure that we're giving 100% 110% to all of our residents. And sometimes, you know, we're not able to do that 110% of the time. So, um, you know, aside from maintenance issues or an accounting issue that may come up, just building relationship and being able to assist someone and give them that level of service is our main priority. And, you know, you can't always do it 100% of the time. And um, I think that's what most struggle with is how could I have done that better or how can I turn this around to make it better and uh, Goodwin management is so good about stuff like that I work under four five amazing people in the Austin office and they're just so good about it and so um, at the end of the day yeah that's the biggest struggle not being able to please everybody but trying to turn it around to make it better and allow owners to recognize that managers aren't perfect, <laughs> management companies aren't perfect, but if you have the thought that everyone matters and you do your best to ensure that you're building that relationship with them, um, I think that's what matters most. Yeah, definitely. Now you you got to wear a lot of hats. You have to deal with a lot of different types of issues, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a balancing act. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, when you hang up that phone or when you send that email, is this going to brighten someone's day? I, it's taken me a long time to learn how to do that. I was kind of always, uh, you know, multitasking on so many levels that sometimes you, I can be short 
in an email and not realize it, you know, and um, you don't really know how somebody's going to interpret an email or text. And so through all of this, and especially during my time at Goodwin, um, you know, I've learned to slow down a little bit. I think COVID, you know, the last two years has taught me how to do that, slow down and to really focus on the person. How can I address this person and tackle their issue in a way that at the end of everything, they will be pleased. So yeah, I feel that that's the biggest struggle, but it can also be mo- most rewarding when done correctly with a, a wonderful team. Well, that's great to hear. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I can say that I think a, a lot of people could could learn quite a bit from exercising their <laughs> their communications that way, just in general absolutely. and outside the yeah. HOA space. So, yes, absolutely. All right. Well, Cole, I thank you again for taking the time to talk today. This has been a great conversation. Um, it's been good learning about uh, your work and that of Goodwin Management as well. So, uh, thank you so much for having me. Definitely, thank you, Nicole, and 